Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> special ed um, service delivery plan for special education and you know we've talked about this all along the way for probably a little well actually over a year now a year and a half or so um, because the very first board meeting that I attended when I started working here I um, recommended the previous draft for approval and that plan committee work was already done um, by the time I got here and the committee had wrapped up their work and I then it was time to recommend the plan. Um, so I did that, and it was, some board members were different at that time, that's why I keep explaining this every single time I present. Um, that, you know, that, that committee at the time, they did exactly what they were asked to do, um, which was to just kind of describe the way, and more thoroughly describe, the way that we provide special education services here in the district. Um, so that, that was, um, that's the draft that you see that looks like this on the front. Um, so, recommended that for approval. The question came up as to, um, that was following the public comment period. The question came up as to how many public comments did we get? Um, and the answer was that we didn't get any. Um, it was posted for the required 30 days, just like it was supposed to be. Um, and we didn't, which in my experience was not a common, um, that a lot of times the plan goes up for public comment and the public mm -hmm. doesn't really comment, um, so we don't really have feedback to, you know, guide any revisions or anything. So I think insightfully at the time, the board said, well, we don't really feel like people may have, they might not even have known it was up for public comment. Um, you know, it was kind of just on the special ed page. And at that time felt like we needed to do some more advertising of the fact that it was even up. Um, and asked us to mail it out to all parents of um, students with IEPs in the district. Um, and then also to post it additionally and push out the um, you know, notice that there was public comment accepted. So we did that and we got some public comments that time. Um, which caused us, I guess, enough concern that we were able to start the whole process over and just really said, you know, we want to take a good long time to do the process right, to start um, right in meaning that we wanted to solicit a lot of public input from the ground up, um, from the very beginning of it. So we launched into a, a process of, um, Um, so we started into a more formal process and at that time um, went out with a, a formal survey for, um, there were a few different uh, versions of the survey for students of, um, parents of students with IEPs, for um, staff, and then for community. And so um, we, we left that open for about a month and got over a thousand responses to that survey. Um, so basically went through um, the process of getting you know that kind of feedback and then uh, went through you know a, a lot more steps that I'm going to describe here in a minute um, and what you see in front of you that looks like this one um, that was loaded to board docs is the the version that we um, have ended up with that is now again up for public comment. It says it's requirements of IDEA here in the district um, and including a continuum of services um, for to guide service provision 
and then a process for determining caseload um, of teachers in the district. And then, you know, the uh, description of how the district will address state identified targets um, or student outcomes, student proficiency outcomes, that kind of thing, um, and then some assurances. And so, as you read through that draft plan for tonight, that's what you would have seen. Um, really, the plan, as far as nuts and bolts of day to day activity, um, it's not supposed to be to that detail. Um, these are, this is kind of a 30,000 foot view, is what the plan is supposed to be. Um, so that's what we've produced. And this is a reference from, actually, from IDEA, um, the federal legislation that guides special education service provision. Um, and some of the key ideas in here, we've, I've pulled out in red for you. Um, that you know, some of the things that have come back within all the feedback that we've gotten that we know we needed to address was that um, service for um, students with disabilities should be um, a set of services instead of a place. Um, that's one of the reasons why I put the side-by-side -side comparison with you because our old plan is sort of, um, probably accidentally, but sort of alludes to places, um, programs. You're in a certain program. Um, you know, that, that's kind of how it reads. Um, you will see a big difference when you compare that to the plan as it is, the draft as it is today. Um, I think that's one of the things that we've addressed really well. Um, and then, of course, our, our requirement as a school district is to provide a free, appropriate public education. Um, what we, in our special ed people, call FAPE. <laughs> um, that's what we have to provide for students with disabilities. So that's always the bar. That we need to that we need to meet um, the minimum bar. Um, so we also want services that are designed to meet the unique needs of individuals um, with disabilities, and not just programs that we have, and then we put kids into them. <coughs> that the the job for the IEP team would be to to innovate a little bit and to within our array of service provision options to customize by picking and choosing different kinds of services, different parts of the day for a student. Um, so I think these are the things that are in red that we've addressed, that we've tried to address um, in our current plan that maybe had it been as strong as we wanted in our previous plan. So, um, you know, I started to go through our timeline. The whole entire project has been a partnership with Grantwood ADA, um, and this is part of the work that our consultant from out of state helped us with, Beth Steenwick. Um, the cost for Beth was shared equally with Grantwood AEA. They funded half of it. Um, so, um, and their their staff, of course, Terry and Tracy, have been involved in, in the entire um, project. So, survey, phone interview, and focus groups, over a thousand responses. Um, and then our district support team analyzed four themes during summer of last year. And I've asked some of our district support team members to come here tonight, and I've also asked them to chime in um, if, as they see fit. Um, so we've been drafting the plan, vetting it out with different groups of people, um, different, you know, the, some of our um, parents, uh, our plan committee, our district leadership team, our AEA uh, partners, and now it's being vetted with the staff, community, um, you know, in a, in a larger sense. So it was posted for public comment on the Friday before Thanksgiving, um, so that we could, we loaded a, actually an option to complete a survey. Um, I really feel like maybe part of the reason why traditionally these plans haven't had a lot of public comment is because it's kind of heavy and maybe people don't exactly know what, what kind of a comment are we looking for, what, what kind of a comment to make. So we wondered if, if we put prompts on in the form of a survey, would we get people who are, you know, if they didn't want to make a narrative comment, maybe they would rate parts of our plan according to a rating scale. Um, so those are intended to be tools. Um, or somebody could just email me directly with any narrative comment they want. So there are two ways to provide that comment, um, and it's open for public review and will be until April 19th. That's also why we specifically planned the work session for tonight because public comment period is open. So we thought maybe people would want to know, hear more about the plan at the work session. 
while they have an opportunity to go out and submit comments to be um, considered. So some of the um, things also that we feel like we have addressed and really wanted to address um, are the IEP teams design individualized services instead of a place or a destination. Um, success of special education students is shared by special education and general education teachers and service providers. Um, that responsibility for the students we're talking about right now is shared joint. Students are first and always gen ed. Um, sometimes we layer additional special ed resources on top of those, those gen ed services. Um, the Iowa, Iowa City Community School District mission applies to all. Um, we, we don't think that that means only some um, or students without disabilities. We think that it applies to all. Um, so, you know, there's one curriculum, the Iowa Core. Sometimes we supplement that with additional learning outcomes that we customize for some specific students. Um, and that, you know, the, what we're really trying to accomplish with special education services is to enable access. Um, it's access to the same outcomes, high level outcomes like non-disabled students are achieving um, transition readiness, post-secondary success, all of those kinds of things that we want for all students. And that services should be provided within the least restrictive environment. Um, so that means to the extent possible that students with disabilities would be educated um, alongside students without disabilities um, in gen ed classrooms. Or sometimes the least restrictive environment means a less restrictive environment. Um, instead of one-on-one, -on -one, maybe that means in a small group um, where they've got other students to learn from, whether or not it's in a general education or a special education classroom. Um, so services can be provided anywhere and should not be based on a program model or a place. So another thing that is different about our draft that actually I've never seen in any other draft um, that I've ever looked at would be a reference to MTSS. Um, that's the short way of saying a multi-tiered system of support. So if you just think about everything that we do in school um, falling into kind of different resource categories. So there are some things that we do for all students, some things that in addition to that we do for some students, and then there are some things in addition to even that that we do for only a few students. Um, special education resources lies at that top tier that are in addition to everything else, all of the benefits of the general program and all, everything that it has to provide and um, offer to all students also applies to students with IEPs. Um, so that's a fancy way to say that it's just everything that we need to do for all of our students in order for them to access a quality education. Um, so everything that we do is somewhere within that MTSS framework. And there, there's more explanation there um, on the document too. It includes instructional practice, um, effective practices, regular data analysis, and um, changing instructional strategies based on that information. Um, and PLC mentality, just meaning that teachers and service providers and people at every level really of the organization have the mentality that we're going to work together for to achieve a shared outcome for the students that we're serving. Um, and the belief of those people that if we work together and we're devoted to working together, that we can make a difference for these students, which by the way is the number one predictor of student success. Um, so everything that we do, and I think this, you know, if there's one takeaway that I would want everyone to, <laughs> to take away from any session that we have or any discussion that we have about this plan, it would really be that the way to, for our students to um, experience success is for us as a district to um, support all, all of our teachers, all of our paras, all of our service providers, all of our administrators in developing a, a culture and um, of growth and learning. And that our students are gonna thrive if our staff are supported and encouraged to grow. And so um, we're never gonna have arrived you know, we're never going to be, that's one of the things I really love about the plan is that there isn't a, we're doing it or we're not. Um, this is a continuum that we're going to continue to pursue and perfect and 
um, innovate around and, you know, um, with a growth mentality. Um, there should be a culture of learning in a learning organization. And um, I think we need to give people permission to learn, permission to try new things, and permission to use this document as a guide in order to be able to do that. So, um, you know, we know that we, this is a tall order. Um, we want it to be. You know, we purposely put together um, a document that would not just help us do good enough for our students with disabilities, but that would help us knock it out of the park um, for all students, including students with disabilities. And so we, in order to get to that level of work, we have to start with the why. Why are we really doing this? Um, because if the answer is because the state requires us to, we're not going to knock it out of the park. Um, you know, we, when we have answers and our staff can articulate like they already have, um, we're doing this because we want the very best for all students here, um, and we're committed to finding out what that is for each individual. Um, you know, we're doing this because we believe that we have extremely capable, professional, um, highly trained individuals here in this organization and we know for sure that if we give them the right tools and the right expectations and the right supports that they can knock it out of the park. Um, that is the kind of stuff that gets us to where we want to be. Um, so the why is extremely important and I hope that as we're doing distribution, communication, training around use of a new plan that every single conversation we have starts with that. Um, we, we're doing this because our students deserve it, and they deserve for us to work hard at it. So we've organized, um, we're, we will have an organized communication plan to all stakeholders, um, and it, that information will trickle out in a number of different ways, and that's kind of what we're working on now is designing wh how will that exactly look. Um, the last thing we want or need is a poster. Uh, we don't want something located on our website that nobody's ever going to see again or that nobody's going to refer to. Um, this document <laughs> needs to live and it needs to be present. We need to be referring to it all the time, wrestling with what it means, painting a vision for how it actually looks in practice and um, on the ground and from a student's lens. Um, so all of that, you know, we'll, we'll consider all of that in our communication. Um, fluidity. Um, I guess also is probably another, another takeaway, um, that we want this to be used as, um, so that teachers and teams and parents and different IEP team members will feel free to um, mix and match in a fluid manner um, to get just the right solution for the individual that they're talking about right then. Um, we want to inspire leadership of principals. Principals are the most important um, local area education agency reps. They serve that role at every IP meeting. Um, for me to come in and serve an LEA rep role, which is a required IEP team member, it's the resource allocator. Um, sure, I can. I actually even like to, because um, I, I barely meet parents unless I do go to an IEP meeting or something like that. Um, but I'm not the person they're going to see every day when they drop their child off at school. They're not the person they want to talk to when they come to their parent-teacher conference. Um, those are the people at the building, and we want to empower them. Um, the, the staff at the building, the teachers, the gen ed teachers, the um, IDS people in the building, and most importantly, the principals to serve an LEA rep role. So um, inclusion of our Grantwood ADA partners has been extremely important, and I think is one of the things that's going really, really well. Um, and that's at every level, too. Um, we work closely in our, some of the people on our um, district support team that are present here tonight have also been working with their ADA counterparts um, because sometimes the, you know, difference between, um, you know, a document and implementation is the common message that you're getting from different people. Um, if you're a person who's <laughs> needing and spending most of your time serving students all day long, you don't have time to sort out different messages from different people. Um, you need to be hearing a common message, um, you know, a similar message from different providers, and that includes district and ADA. So I think that's probably what we've been working most on. Um, and then just having the, the opportunity to have a lot of conversations for 
well, what is it we really do want it? And how do we make a document that's a reference to when we, I keep telling people, when someone in California um, says, well, I wonder what this Iowa's, you know, Iowa City Community School District is about, and they bring up this special ed plan, I don't want there to be any question. Um, I want them to read it and say, well, I know what these people are about. Um, they're about equity, and they're about equity of educational opportunity. Um, and that they're about, um, you know, comparable outcomes for students with disabilities and that, you know, that they trust their teachers and teams to innovate within a structure. Um, so I think that's, that's been an advantage for us to be able to just even have the time to have those conversations. And I, I think that's more of a common message now than it has been. Um, and then we'll have to differentiate our assistance to buildings and teams um, because we know that um, some people, you know, when they when they read this document, they're going to be thinking, "Oh, this makes a lot of, you know, this makes a lot of sense. Maybe this is kind of similar to a plan that I had in another district, or yeah, it just it just makes sense the way I'm reading it." Other people will say, "Gosh, we've been doing business a little bit different way for a long time, and I'm having trouble getting my mind around exactly what would this look like then." As I, if I as a teacher, I'm going to need to go in and lead an IEP meeting. How do I talk about this in an informed way so that you know um, so that I can feel confident in an IEP meeting leading that process? Um, so we know that just like our students that come in, we know that our teachers, our principals, our staff are all going to need varying amounts of support, and that we need to di we need to have a um, plan to differentiate that support for people um, because they're learners too because we're a learning organization and we have a culture of learning here. So I think that um, our next steps, you know, like I said, until April 19th, it's open for public comment. And during that time, one of the things um, that we have, I've already noticed from some of the survey comments and from the survey comments that came in from our plan committee is that we're finding, even though we may not be actually changing the document based on an exact um, example given or a comment given, a lot of times that's providing insight to us as to what's going to be needed for support and clarification and training and um, coaching and how are we going to get it lived out. Um, so I think that's a lot of what we want to hear. So uh, any and all comments are welcome and every one of them will be considered. They have been so far and they will continue to be. Um, there's no reason that we needed to do this kind of a job. Um, we didn't need to go out with any kind of a survey. That's not a, that's not a requirement. Um, all of the input that we've been seeking, we have been seeking it because we want it. We're using it. We're open to it. Um, it's not a requirement. So I just you know, want to honestly put that word out for, for the public. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what, what seat you're sitting in. If you're a parent of a student with disability, if you're just a concerned community member, um, if your staff, whoever, um, all all comments are, we're happy to get them. So, and then we'll need a um, regular feedback loop of some kind um, to inform our work about, like, what are the next steps? Then um, the plan only changes every five years, um, typically, and so the plan probably won't need to be changed after it's adopted, but what might need to be changed is our perspective on supporting it um, and getting you know, the right kind of support out for it. So um, we'll revise based on you know, any needed revisions. Like I said, the plan we have was based, based primarily on over 1,000 survey responses. So my guess is it won't change a whole lot. Um, it's, it's pretty near what it will probably be, although some feedback from the plan committee got us to put like the um, vocabulary definitions on there, the um, glossary of terms. Um, we could add to it, we could adjust it slightly, um, but the, the body of information it's based on is so broad <laughs> that um, I don't think we'll get a, a, you know, feedback that says, hey, you need to start this over or anything like that. I think it's, it's pretty it's pretty solid where it is, but we definitely want to tweak it um, if it doesn't make sense to people. So we have the, um, then it'll, as soon as those final adjustments are made, then it will go to Maria Cashman at the um, AEA, the AEA Special Ed Director, um, for her approval. She's been watching our process all along, so, um, 
you know, I don't, I don't think there will be a problem with getting that and then recommend it to the, the board tentatively on the 14th. So the training communication, um, organized support for the plan will be during the 1920 school year and beyond because we'll always be supporting it. Everything that, um, I also put in your board docs the summary of the items that, um, so you know when I said that af after all those survey responses, phone interviews, focus groups, our um, district support team identified six main themes of things that we really felt like across that huge body of information kind of needed some sort of action. It didn't all need to be and it wouldn't all appropriately be in this special ed plan, but that doesn't mean we're not going to address it. So right now we have a, a separate parking place for that other stuff in what we're just right now calling the continuous improvement plan. Um, and that's more of an action plan. Um, so, you know, what, what are some of the things that, um, like professional learning is one of them. You know, we wouldn't write the exact professional development opportunities that we have going on within our special ed plan, but we do have, need to have an organized plan for it. And, you know, what, one that we can come back and um, adjust along the way as we get feedback from people too. So, we're just kind of starting to bit, uh, put bits and pieces of that together, um, getting the formal plan approved is, was the priority. So I'm going to open it up to the rest of our team for any other <coughs> insights you'd want to throw in. Um, you know, all, all of these uh, folks that have come with me tonight have a little bit different seat on our team. Um, you know, we have Kristen, who is right now a teacher at Northwest Junior High, sorry Kristen. Um, and, you know, and then some people who are um, IDS, um, our behavior specialist, um, Megan, we even have Ann back here. So I'm inviting you to comment if I have forgotten to say anything. Thank you, Carmen. <laughs> I think we talked about it all night. <laughs> I actually do it. <laughs> I just want to applaud your work and this team's work because you're transforming from a compliance based sort of culture here to equity. And you know, we talk a lot about equity at our board. It's a huge priority of ours. We heard from the equity earlier tonight as they're up updating their comprehensive equity plan. And so this resonates. This is the right thing to do. And we follow the fantastic process and the fact that you're soliciting feedback and listening and incorporating it is to be commended. I think you've done a fantastic job and I can't wait to see the results of the final, you know, input process and, and to keep moving on this. And, and just the spirit of it is just uh, very, I, I'm not being very, very articulate tonight, but it's, it's lovely. It's, it's, it's the right thing to do and I just thank you for your effort. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, um, and I, I'm just looking at your uh, committee makeup and everything, and I, uh, you utilize the University of Iowa and uh, the Catwood uh, reps. It's uh, uh, excellent, but I don't see anyone here. Uh, uh, I don't see a single AD, athletic director, and we're talking about inclusion and. Everything that all the other students are active in, they should be active in. Um, as far as you know, our goal for them to be educated, employed, and uh, independently living. Um, all the attributes that we put into sports for our other students uh, is still there for our uh, special ed students. And I know in years past we used to compete uh, with the Special Olympics up in Ames. And uh, that was a great experience because students got to get outside of their home sometimes for the first time mm -hmm. from their families and that's a that's a huge experience yeah. uh, I remember when I experienced it that was my first time away from my family independently was with a sporting event uh, so uh, I, I would encourage um, inclusion you know, with the millions of dollars we spent on our sports facilities let's make sure all students uh, are included in using that and, and I would push for uh, us to compete uh, in, in special ed events, not just in Iowa City for one day, that type of a thing, 
Um, there was a broadcast about a, a young lady from uh, Cedar Rapids who competed in Dubai uh, in the International uh, Special Olympics there. Yeah. And uh, you know, I don't think it's unrealistic that some students from our community could be in that same situation. And, and, and would just urge you to uh, include them as well. Yeah, um, I'm going to comment on that um, because that actually would have to be board action. It's a um, act, it has to be paid for by, with activity money. We can't actually spend special ed money to fund special Olympics events at all. Um, so it has to be an act, just funded like all the other activities are through an activity fund. But student activity funds could be there's correct. But it seems to me that student activity funds that are used for our Gen Ed students could be used for. Uh, our other students, we, we bought a $500 radar camera tonight for baseball. I think we can we can we, we have money for yeah. uh, equipment for our uh, for our other students. Yeah, I I I don't know what's in the I don't know what I don't know much about the activity funds, but yes, I mean I, I'm assuming yes, but that's why I would need have needed to bring it up with the board because it's not within um, special ed budget at all. It can't, it's not an approved use of, of special ed funds. So, but other district funds can be the same ones that you're talking about. Yeah, it's, it's, we we're, were to uh, provide opportunities for all kids. Right. But no kid's denied an opportunity. If there's a special education student that wants to participate in this board, they're allowed. Yes. Um, so, yes. Yes, the short answer is yes. That, um, you know, if it's a competitive event, they, um, all students have to qualify for the same types of qualifications and so forth but yes no nobody is <clears throat> eliminated from participating but I, I understand what you're saying that some students um, while they could they're not going to and they haven't participated in specifically participation in extracurriculars is one of the things that we're hoping to achieve so much that we actually put it on our special ed plan right um, there's so a I reason think special uh, special Olympics exists absolutely it's for their yes. participation Right. It's easy to say anybody can go out for it, but yeah. there's but reasons why Special Olympics exist. Well, and that's it's, and it's to mean. encourage their participation right. and to allow them a form to compete. Yeah. I wasn't debating that, I was just simply saying that if I, there's students. I understand. Yeah, 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 I, I understand. clear about that so that people yeah. don't think that if you have a disability, you can't be in it, right. you can be well, in anything else. But, 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 but we, we know that. Um, that you know, a competitive nature of especially secondary type sports and that sort of thing sometimes um, makes it impossible for for some of our students with you know more severe disabilities to. So that's where it's nice to have special Olympics. And so we yeah. could, we could have it. Um, I highly support special Olympics. Right. And you I want to have encourage that. more than just being a manager. Right. Yeah. 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 That would be. That's something we can discuss with the. I just, I just want to give an anecdote because I was <clears throat> talking about this plan with a former teacher, you know, who was in the district years ago and <clears throat> came in and was placed in like a BD assignment without certification and was working towards it and was totally unsupported and just quit as soon as she had an opportunity. Was so burnt out. And when I all I mentioned was um, the part of the plan that says one special ed is a service and not a place. And that all students are Gen Ed students first. She just, it was like, oh my gosh. And you could see, and that's the example of the different cultures. That this is setting the stage for what um, idea, like the spirit of it, yeah. right? And not just the letter. Yeah. And her response, you know, for a burnout teacher to get a little fire and like, oh, like, maybe I'd think about working yeah. in the district again is was really, really significant. Good. And I didn't have to go into any details, you and, you and I've gone through the whole thing, you know, obviously on the committee, and it's it's a tall order, and I, I appreciate that, right? But I, I think, you know, on one parallel to the equity work we did this summer is when we were doing the boundary discussion, we that's what we started with, the why. And we went out to the community, we explained the why, and I think that it, then it gives you something to get behind. And you can really, um, you know, sink your teeth into it, and and for all of them, the tangible things. So I applaud you, and I'm I'm looking forward to the to the continuous implementation. I know um, the differentiation is is going to be a key component. You know, how do we help folks 
who, who've been used to doing things a certain way, kind of come around to understanding that, that there are ways that are going to be more effective, that are going to be better for those kids. And so, um, uh, and, and I also, frankly, Lisa, like the understated way you're doing this, like if I, I get super passionate, I'd probably be like standing on tables, and you probably do that like in your office. <laughs> <laughs> Only here. in here in this office. Um, yeah. But it, it's, it's it, I can't really understate how excited I am about this, um, or, or can't overstate it, I should say. Um, yeah, we we want to be the um, we want to be a destination of choice as a district yes. um, for staff. For I mean, we want teachers to want to work here. We want yeah. parents to want to be here because their kids deserve that. Yes. We want students to want to be here. Yes. Um, across the board, we want to be a destination of choice, and I want it to be because what we're doing is just that good. Yeah. Um, not because of the millions of other reasons that people might want to be here and, and do want to be here. Um, but there's a difference between wanting to be here for superficial reasons and wanting to be here because I believe in what these people are doing. I really, really want to work for this. I mean, I, I, it's worth doing. And that's what we want. Um, so that, I, think that's what, I think that's really what we're trying to do. Um, our teachers will do what is right, but we need to give them permission and inspire them mm -hmm. um, and make sure that they understand if they don't, then who's going to? Mm -hmm. um, that's what they're here for. And it, once people hear that, and it's like, you mean I can do it? I've had a lot of people say, I'll suggest something, I'll say, you mean I can do that? Mm -hmm. Yes, you can do that. <laughs> um, yeah, because we'll do anything for our kids. We, we have to. Um, if we don't, who will? So, you know, people can get behind that kind of thing. Yeah. That's why the why is important. So we're going to take the right time to roll this out. We've taken the right amount of time to create it. Um, you know, at one point we weren't even in compliance. Uh, we're not going to strive to be in compliance. Yes, of course we want to be in compliance, but we want so much more than that. Um, we're not shooting for a low bar here. I mean, what we're wanting is the moon. So that's going to take a long time. We're never going to be done with it, and that's okay. Anything else? Hi, Lisa. I was just going to say I'm so sorry I arrived late. I had to teach on Tuesday nights, but it was so great being a part of this. I was so disappointed I, I was going to miss Lisa's presentation, but I'm so pleased that the board is recognizing the hard work and the passion that's been put into this all year. And I think I'd be remiss if I didn't just acknowledge the people who served on the committee with us, but especially um, Lisa's leadership in all of this and her experience from all her districts and, and what she brought to this and this this continuous passion and wanting to learn and that, okay, what are we learning in our current mistakes and driving us forward? So I just wanted to compliment Lisa again, just publicly, and I'm sorry I missed that presentation, but I'm, I'm sure it was really good. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for saying that. Um, you know, you can't be a leader unless people will follow you. <laughs> um, people will follow doing what's right. If, if really, if, you know, uh, people here want to do what's right. So, um, you know, and, and pretty soon that, that's just the effort on its own. Um, it doesn't really have anything to do with me. I would just add a couple things as I think about um, the board leadership at the time when we were experiencing the non-compliance issues, um, Lisa coming in, and then it was uh, kind of the perfect storm that this district service delivery plan, I always get it all jumbled, um, was due and the board sent it back because we didn't have the feedback and that ultimately ended up with this great product, right? The thing that I want to draw your attention to that you might not be aware of is a couple of things. I remember I think it was Chris Lynch at the time saying, you know, let's look at this as an opportunity with the non-compliance. Let's see if we can get better from here and obviously we're setting the stage through what you see tonight uh, to have that happen. But the other thing that Lisa kind of breezed through that I don't know if you caught was um, during that non-compliance piece, the state had um, uh, asked us or told us we were going to be working with an outside provider, and that was Beth Steenwick. And um, so we had that in place for that year. But then the AEA and Lisa came to us and said, we'd be willing to continue to work with Beth if we could you know, equally fund it the following year. And so when you see um, her talking about that, um, we took that, that consultant, the outside consultant, and didn't look at it, just that we're going to um, work on this improvement through her and then we'll be done with it. We continue to utilize her and they're asking and thinking about uh, continuing to utilize her for another year. So we'll just add those few things, but thank with you. With Grant Wood picking up half the tab again. Right. <coughs>
So um, if, if it's so. important enough to do it, it's important enough to do it right. Um, and helping to really get it to reach the kids. If it doesn't reach the kids, it doesn't matter if we did it. Um, so you know, that's a different kind of improvement work. It, it's a long-term, a long-term project. So, but we have a good start. <coughs> stuck in that interview and then I didn't want to come sit in front of the, the monitor there. We talked forever. <laughs> That's famous last word. <laughs> still work in your same building? Um, do you plan to retire? Uh, would you like to work at a different level in your building? Would you like to move to a different building? Are you planning on transitioning out of the district for some other opportunity? A spouse or significant other is moving, you're going to grad school, whatever it is. Uh, we got a 95% return rate. Um, and we got that return rate because the association was very cooperative in putting the word out with their staff and saying this is really to help us better meet the needs of staff. One of the things that came out of that uh, was uh, we were able to then align the responses uh, that people provided with us with your personnel agenda to see who had indicated whether or not they were retiring. Um, and what we found was there was a gap there. Um, what that led us to believe is that there were quite a few people who were not planning to elect the early retirement option, but were also not planning to work for the district on July 1st. Uh, awkward position for the district. We can't necessarily reach out to them um, from an administrative standpoint and put some pressure on them and ask them what they're doing, where they're going next year. And so we turned to the association um, and we said, we know that there's this gap out there in knowledge. Can you help us with this? And Brady was very gracious. He said yes. He'd take that to the rep council. He'd share that issue with the rep council. He'd ask them to take that back to their buildings, to share that with their staff. And really the message was, as we're dealing with budget reductions, uh, if you know you're not going to be here, I understand there's a sense of security in keeping your contract because you have that continuity of moving on next year and retaining that position if things change. But at the same time, uh, if you know you're going and you're willing to let that go, that may save somebody's job who works in the building next to you or across the street or across town. Uh, and as a result of that, we wound up with 16 individuals um, who shared with us that they're planning on moving on at the end of the year. Obviously not the best thing. We don't like to see people move on, but there's lots of good reasons that they can <coughs> do that. Um, we also opened up the retirement window. Um, we don't only get one more retirement, and I'll share with you, I think that's why you may have gotten some emails today, so we'll come back to that. Um, but then collectively between that, you can see that uh, uh, we have 61 people um, who uh, in one way or another have indicated that they are moving on next year. So again, I, I want to say thanks publicly to Brady and the ICDA for helping out with that. That wasn't something we could do on our own. We had to do that in collaboration with them. So we've got 61 folks that are moving on. You remember way back when we started this process, we were looking at a six and a half million dollar budget deficit and we were looking at having to eliminate 75 people um, in order to make that happen. So between then and now, uh, we wound up with an increase in supplemental state aid. That helped us. Uh, we put that early retirement plan into place. That helped us. We got confirmation on these resignations and that helped us. So collectively then, we have 61 vacated positions next year. Uh, and then remember that as we went through and looked at the budget in order to make things balanced, uh, we knew that uh, we're looking at 21 
a reduction of 21 positions uh, in our elementary classrooms. We're looking at a reduction of nine positions uh, in our six secondary schools. Um, we've got three teacher librarians, uh, which we propose to hold vacant. And then we've got some uh, uh, additional uh, staff, staff reductions in specials areas that correspond directly to, I've got to roll up again here, um, the reduction in our elementary classrooms. Um, and so those are simply maintaining the same level of uh, staff assignments uh, for teachers who teach uh, art, music, or PE at the elementary level, but because there are simply fewer sections to be staffed, there winds up being a reduction in the number of staff people in our specials area. Uh, you'll also remember that as we've gone through this process, we have had numerous uh, uh, items that have fallen down here at the bottom of the chart. Uh, we've had attendance support busing. Uh, we looked at our curriculum instruction adoption budget, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the last two that were on here were Title I and dropout prevention. Um, you'll notice that there are no dollar values next to them at this point in time. Um, I left them on there so that we had the opportunity to discuss this. Uh, but as of right now, and again, remember our conversation has been about hard stops. Where are the things that cause you the most concern as we move forward in terms of the impact on students? I think we heard loud and clear from you your real concern about um, meeting the needs of our, our most uh, uh, in need students that are served through dropout prevention and through Title I support. Uh, and so we worked hard and we were able to zero out those uh, budget reductions. So if you go down to the bottom now, you'll see that we have, let's make the cursor work here, we have a slight surplus down there, $11,000. I call that a rounding error given the magnitude of the numbers that we're working at. Um, but uh, this allows us to balance the budget without making any programmatic changes. We are simply doing this through attrition, through retirement and resignation, and holding appropriate positions vacant. I said hang on a second because remember up north I told you that there are now 45 rather than 44 retirements. Um, one of the reasons I think you got some emails today was that we have a couple of key uh, music staff folks who are retiring. Um, we also have some uh, key folks in uh, family and consumer sciences, for instance, who are retiring. Um, those aren't positions where we have somebody else in the district that has a certification that we can transfer into those positions. Uh, and so those are positions we'll have to go outside to fill. But we know that because when you do the math here, you'll see that we have fewer positions that we need to remain vacant than we do <coughs> exits for resignations or retirements. Um, we had a long conversation today with our uh, secondary folks about uh, in order for us to make this model work, we obviously have to go out uh, and look for teachers who are new to the profession. Um, to help us uh, meet this budget goal. Uh, Jane Fry, who's not with us today, was at uh, uh, Ames recently, uh, specifically to recruit family and consumer science teachers. Um, we know we've got three retirements in that area. We don't have other people in the district that are certified in that area, so we'll have to go outside to find that. So when you look at this model, um, I think that there's a concern out there that because we've talked about holding positions vacant, that the presumption was every single position that was vacated through retirement or resignation would be vacant. We thought that was going to be the case initially. But as we've been able to get uh, tighter on the numbers here, um, we know that we're going to be able to fill some of those positions. So we know what some of those key positions are. Um, and right now, uh, we're working with the team to identify uh, where those folks are um, and, if appropriate, get postings up um, so that we don't get too far behind the hiring curve um, recognizing that uh, uh, there are a lot of districts out there right now that are already actively recruiting for vacancies. So uh, we are uh, just, uh, as I said uh, earlier today with our, our grant update, uh, we are, are cautiously optimistic. This obviously is not a good thing that we're having to go through this, but I think we've made the best bad choices that we had uh, available to us. Um, and I think with that, we're able to present to you a set of reductions that will bring you a balanced budget for the 1920 school year. So I went through that relatively quickly, but I know you have heard it from me many, many, many times now. I appreciate you allowing me to come back every couple weeks. I know it's a bit it's like a watching us. sausage get made, but I think okay. by working through the process, you have a better understanding of it. Yeah, I think this looks better than last time. Yeah, it feels better and than you last addressed, time. And you addressed the concerns you raised last time. So thank you for that. So what can I answer for you this time? No, so, on the... Uh, IJAC's off now. Yes. Is that still planned to be fundraised by the foundation or? No, we were going to, uh, when we were looking at reducing both IJAG and the uh, Kirkwood Workplace Learning Connection, uh, we'd gone to the foundation uh, with a request that they help us um, fundraise for both of those for our portion of it. Um, we are now able to fund that uh, from our portion, so we won't be asking the foundation 
um, to reach out for that. You know, one of the things, and, and I think Sarah did a nice job explaining uh, it earlier, uh, it's not unlike our EOS uh, work, our Equal Opportunity Schools work, where we put a little bit of money in and then that leveraged more money and that leveraged more money. Uh, so with IJAG, uh, as a district, we put a little bit of money in, but then uh, there are also local fundraisers here in town that help pay for that, and then we're also uh, collecting money uh, from uh, the state of Iowa. So, you know, you're looking at upwards of a quarter million dollar investment in the district, um, of which $40,000 of it uh, comes out of our general fund, <coughs> 40000 comes out of our Title IV fund. Uh, so, so, so only eighty, uh, only forty thousand comes out of the general fund for IJ, and then forty thousand comes out of our Title IV budget for it, and that's general fund as as well. Uh, Title IV is categorical funds that come to us from the federal government. Okay, yeah. but originally we were fundraising for eighty. We were looking at eighty because we were looking at replacing the Title IV component also. So okay. now, okay. now we're feeling very strong about both. So we're able to make our contribution. That allows us to leverage the. Uh, uh, the dollars that come to us from uh, our local uh, fundraisers that actually give directly to IJAG and then from the state that uh, contributes a, a significant portion. Since since that is not no longer a foundation thing, or have we thought of using the foundation for something else? Um, actually, I have a meeting with Susan tomorrow to talk about that. So uh, it was a stretch for them, I'll tell you that. She was, uh, let's see, what's the right word? A tad apprehensive about it because that was above and beyond their asks. but. Uh, at the same time, she's been a great partner and said, if you're asking me to do that, I will help you do that. Um, so uh, I just shared with her actually yesterday that we're not going to ask them to do that. And so we set up a meeting tomorrow to talk about uh, other other things that we need to target. Now, there are STEM grants. I know, I know there's there, there are grants available for first-time ag programming. And I forget, I forget exactly the amount. Uh, but there are many businesses in our community that are very inter interested about that program as well. Um, have, have we reached out to any of those to see about their possible participation in this? I, without Matt here, I don't know if there's been any specific action <coughs> STEM grants for specific businesses, but I can find that out for you. Okay, because it, 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 it was some, I know it was a substantial amount of money, and, and it was for first-time startups. I will find that out and get an answer for you. Um, One thing, just going through the, the bills and everything, I'm concerned with, with just some of our, our general fund spending and opportunities we have, have there for some savings. And it's, it's kind of a line, along the lines of what Paul was talking about at the other one. They're not huge amounts, but little things add up. And, you know, we've, we've got, uh, this, this was known for several years, and, and, and I just looked at, the bills that we had, this, especially this last period, and, and uh, some of the travel and some of the expenses, expenditures there. Um, I think we should recognize this isn't a long-term thing. We're hoping, we're hoping uh, that you know it's it, we we come out of it better. But uh, you know we should be looking at opportunities and recognizing that maybe we put off. And and, and I see that you know some of the. Some of the trip was covered by some other grant or something like that. But still, four thousand came out of the general fund. And could something have been done here locally or something along those lines? Understanding that it's not a long-term uh, pain, we're we're telling that we're going to have to endure. But it it it's hard to justify, uh, you know, a, a trip to Disney World when. Uh, we're making some of the other sacrifices and things like that. But you know, I'm not sure if you're looking for a response, but I mean, I don't, you know, the Disney World example is a tough one. I, I don't, I fully believe our staff isn't down there riding into Small World or the teacups, right? And we don't pick the locations of the conferences. And I agree with you. If we could do them here locally, we would, we would do them here locally. But it puts us in a very difficult situation, regardless if you're a teacher, an administrator, someone from our plants <coughs> or anywhere else, if we cut staff but then also say, we're not going to send you to get the training that you need. How do we continue to maintain our premier teaching workforce, <coughs> as well as our administrators, if we're, if we're pushing them from both ends? 
Phil, I 100% agree with you that we need to look at ways to do things locally and to do train the trainer model. <coughs> but Amy and Diane, the team, do a really good job of doing that when they can. But if the training is offered in a place that is only offered there, we hurt ourselves in the long run if we tell people they can't get those trainings. I, I, it is an, it's a balancing act, but I'm with you. Like Craig and I had this conversation out in the hallway after you made the comment. I'm shocked that some of these large organizations that do these conferences don't get the exact same feedback that you're giving. And somebody doesn't go to them and say, why are you doing these things in places that you know your people are going to get hammered for when they go home? But they continue to offer them in places that they think they're going to draw people to the conferences. And that are also expensive to go yeah, to right. and stay at. Right. Yeah. But I, I, so I get what you're saying, but I think the question becomes, okay, if we're not going to let people go to those, what is the alternative going to be to make sure that our folks continue to get the, pro the professional development they need? We're, we're blessed with the Big Ten College. Uh, we've got Grantwood AEA. I, I think to, to look at it, and, and, and I understand where you're coming from, and believe me, I know the challenges we're facing because we've got 2,000 years plus leaving yeah. with, with Dr. McReynolds. Now we're well over 2,000. Uh, leaving our, our buildings um, and I don't think that you know you overcome that with youth and, uh, and, uh, and vigor um, I, I, it, it's, uh, it, it's it's a challenge but it's not long term and to, to, to say we recognize the importance of this I think also sends a, a, a message that we're uh, we're, so we take it seriously. We, we take it seriously, and we're and we're looking at these funds. And I mean, there's I, I didn't. And there's another one in there, and, and I'm and I'm and I'm, I, I'm torn to use it as an example. No, no, you're fine. It, it's it's uh, uh, ten thousand dollars worth of equipment for uh, industrial arts at West High. Uh, <coughs> now, some of this equipment is in the High V warehouse, and I'm really concerned that you know we're we're paying fourteen thousand dollars a month for a warehouse to house equipment that we went out and bought. You know, and, and I some and, and that's where I get into are there opportunities for us on to, in in that general fund spending? Sometimes it doesn't seem like the right hand knows what the left hand's doing. So um so I, th I think that you are right and your point about it being short term is well taken and is spot on. But I think it's that same thinking, and maybe this is what Steve was going to say, so I apologize, of why you're seeing the cuts that are proposed from the administration. Because if we only continue to look at short-term solutions, we'll be back around this table year after year after year looking at nickel and dime cuts to get us through the next fiscal year. What we're trying to do is look at ways that we can put ourselves in a position long term so we don't continue to have this conversation. So we don't have to continue to say, well, who can we, you know, who can we ask to squeeze a little bit more this year? And so we're not looking for things that are going to only solve tomorrow. We're looking for things that are going to solve the next decade and are going to put us back in a trajectory. Now, the point about having to tighten the, the, the belt loop, straps, whatever the saying is, is always good because we're a public employer. And we always need to watch out. And we always need to be careful about how we're how we're looking and spending the taxpayers' dollars. But it needs to be in a systematic approach so that we're not constantly trying to, to count the numbers. Can I add? So one I think thing it's a combination of both. I guess is what I'm is what I'm saying. Steve jumps in. I appreciate what you're saying also about the general fund. I think if you started to just look at um, travel and professional de development in general you're going to see the majority of it coming out of um, the state and federal funds that are given to us specifically for professional development purposes. So Title I, Title II, Title III, Title IV, and then at, at the state level, TQSA or Iowa Corps. That doesn't mean we don't have flexibility in not, in not having people leave the district to go receive that um, or to pay for subs for presenters to come in. But fill up also sat at the table up there when you're trying to reject contracts when we're bringing presenters in. So we're trying to do that too, and I feel like every time we turn around, you know, we're being, we're, that's being looked at. So if, if, we, if you don't want us to go outside to get the information, you've got to let us bring people in well. well. And, and like I say, we have resources here that every time I go and talk with other <laughs> school boards, we'd kill to have 
a Big Ten college in their district for, for what they have to offer and, and that. It's, and, and like, a, 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 and I, you're, you're valid, I, I have, uh, and I know, I, 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 I've, I've questioned uh, $5,000 for a day for one person to come in. Yeah. Uh, yes, a lot. Uh, it's a lot of money. Um, but uh, uh, I, uh, I, I think that I think there's up. I, I just like I say. I think there's I think there's opportunities there uh, uh, for those uh, for those things to happen. Um, and and I think too uh, when I I look at the middle management and some of our our schools, and I've gotten this from staff that and there's opportunities there as well. Well, so, I'll explain that a little bit. Well, at, at a junior high, uh -huh. uh, principal, assistant principal, a dean of students, uh, are, there some, are there some opportunities there for uh, short-term situations that uh, we recognize it's not long-term? But and, and there again, uh, we're going on the assumption that everything in a year or two gets great. Uh, Procter and Gamble's layoffs haven't haven't fully been uh, haven't haven't fully affected us until is it 2020, when I when think, uh, they start the uh, year and they stretch out over 18 months. Right. So I I mean that that's still coming, and we don't know what other uh, employers in the community might might have uh, things that affect our enrollment numbers and and, and that. So um, I hope I hope it's right and it's just. This year is the hardest part, and then we then we come out of it. But uh, I'll, I'll say that you're you're right on target, Phil, because I think that our mantra has been to plan for the worst. Mm -hmm. We hope for the best, but we plan for the worst. Uh, and and we we really take to heart uh, the impact uh, that this process has had and the input that you provided. Um, I know that uh, we've been working with our, our team here, uh, the entire staff uh, at the ESC, uh, to think globally about the district as a whole and how we operate and where we spend our money um, and where there are opportunities for us. You know, our biggest challenge is that 16 cents out of every dollar is what goes to anything that's not a person. And out of that, we spend $6 million at the ADA flow through. We have very little control of it. However, and we talked about this before at length, uh, Phil, about um, what can we do to try to leverage the resources that the ADA provides us so that perhaps they better align with the needs that we have so that there might be some costs that we can forego out of our general fund that they can cover through that. Um, transportation, we struggle with that. That's another big component of that, uh, it's that 16 cents. And I know that when we went through and had the discussion about uh, attendance support busing, that's, that one really, we struggle with that collectively as a board and administrative team. Kids aren't in school, they can't learn. Uh, and, and so uh, what we're committed to moving forward is to literally looking at every nickel in that 16 cents. We've already started that process uh, because as we move forward and we think about <coughs> recovering these positions that are up top here, um, as we think about putting these folks back into the classroom, some of that's going to come from supplemental state aid, but some of it may come from more efficient operations inside the district. So we may be able to accelerate that if we can do a better job spending that 16 cents. Uh, so this may sound like a we're done with it, let's dust our hands and move on. I do want you to know that that's not the case. Um, we continue to work with the admin team, we continue to work with support staff, uh, and, and we've talked about how else we might activate uh, their participation in helping us figure out ways to do things more effectively. Um, so we've got a procure ongoing annual process. Yeah, we've got identifying your cost savings initiatives based on some kinds of efficiency. And some, but we, whatever it may be, yeah. and you give yourself a target every year and you go after it. And well, it. and we look at uh, folks like in our procurement department, right? So they get a chance to work collectively with all 30 <coughs> schools out there. And, and so we've been asking the questions, where do you see um, opportunities? Are there things that we could be doing, even if, to your point, Phil, even if they save a small amount of money, a small amount of money replicated over 30 buildings, replicated over a couple of years, that adds up to a, a real difference and again gives us an opportunity to impact us. So if we portrayed that we're not looking at that, that was our error. Um, we have heard that, we have gone out and gathered the data. Um, I've got a spreadsheet of ideas that came in. Some of them are, are literally nickels, um, some of them are bigger than that. 
Um, some are feasible, uh, some would be a stretch for us, but uh, we are seriously looking at those. Uh, and and uh, it's everything from how we staff, um, and that, that's top to bottom uh, uh, in all areas. Uh, and I, I think there'll be opportunities for us as we move forward to use that input um, from line staff to do a better job of their operations. Well, and, and uh, uh, on the uh, course of study at the secondary level, um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's disheartening that the course that we've promised our students twice, they've come before us and we said, nope, first time, yeah, we just didn't have our ducks in a row. Second time, yeah, for sure we're going to have Ooh. Should make one clarification. Ethnic studies will run at City High. They did get enough students to sign up there. Unfortunately, we don't have enough students that have signed up at uh, at Liberty or West. Now, is yeah. is there and, and and to that end, is there an opportunity? And I know that we offer courses for students at the University of Iowa, and I don't think anything we're doing here changes that. So mm -hmm. the one student that wants to take Russian or a foreign language sure. or thing like that, they're still going to be able to do that. Is there any opportunity for that ethnic studies course for students to take at the University of Iowa on, under a, diff, a comparable curriculum? There may be. You know, one of those things we have to do for those PSEO classes is um, there has to be a demonstration that there isn't a course available on campus that meets that. We'd be able to do that, but then they have to find an equivalent class that would enroll a, a freshman. Uh, in that because that's the way the university considers that. So that's certainly an opportunity for us. Uh, you know, I'll tell you with AG right now, uh, we struggle with 45, uh, 44 total kids sign up for it. Um, we do have one student right now who's taking a class at West Branch. We've already reached out to Clear Creek and said, what opportunities might we have to send students to Clear Creek? We've asked Clear Creek, is it possible if you'd consider teaching your class at the regional center so that we could well, uh, bus, if the kids would bus out there? So we're looking. We, 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 dis we discussed the regional center, and, and, and I would defer to Kevin Kenny. And, yeah. he, and during, during our discussion, Kevin Kenny had the best uh, discussion on why you don't do it with the regional center. The regional center can't handle FFA, which is yeah. as, big or, uh, as big a reason why that curriculum, we need that curriculum. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, we have, uh, I know of a, a person from Regina. I don't know how much we reached out to Regina uh, for students to, uh, to be, in, be in the program as well. Um, like I say, I, 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 have, I have trouble where we, we make, as a board, we make priorities, we agree on them, we're going forward, and we can't follow through. But the only thing I would offer on that, which, which I think is similar to this, is, is uh, we have a regular process where we allow uh, teachers to propose new classes. They go through a, a, a vetting process. They bring it forward. You approve it as a course of studies. But the one thing we always tell them, which maybe we should have said directly to the board when we went through this process and we weren't as explicit with, but we always tell the teachers, Brady, you're here. I'd ask you to corroborate this. We always tell the teachers, you can develop the class. We can approve it. We'll put it in the, car, uh, the calendar, the program of studies. But if kids don't sign up for it, we're not going to offer it. No, um, and, and so that's that's what yeah, we always I, tell our, our staff when they propose new right. classes. Right, and and we've got a list of courses in here that have very small enrollment, but we, we still did it. Project Lead the Way didn't start with 150 kids the first year. IJAG started with 40 or less uh, the first year it had. So we understand that there are certain things that we offer, uh, knowing it's a slow process, like Sarah said. Word of mouth got around absolutely. Uh, there's a reason why it's it's big in in, in schools that have it, yep. uh, and and that. But uh, I'll I'll. Uh, I don't think I'll, I think I think we weren't in a budget reduction phase. We wouldn't even be having this conversation. Well, I I I, 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 I I understand that, and, and that. But uh, I I I really want us to, uh, and I'm I'm glad to hear that that there is. But we have other opportunities to. Uh, to save and we've, we've got to we've got to look at everything. I, I, when we work, we get goals every year around efficiencies, cost reductions, and we we identify the levers and we put action plans in place. And like I said, you deliver your numbers. And if it's five percent, ten percent, two percent, whatever, I go find a way to make it happen. Um, and so I don't, I'm, I'm sure 
maybe we just need more visibility to those things um, that you're doing, Steve. I think maybe that's part yeah. of the, the question right now. Yeah, I have one thing on that with the travel. Um, because I know how important it is. I know that, PD, I know that you know, years ago when the district said teachers weren't going to ever do it, you know, you really, the learning opportunities you get at those, especially national conferences, uh, are, are tremendous. Um, but, at, you know, at work it's the same thing when, the, when hospitals in a tight budget situation, they just, they don't get rid of it, but they just drop down the percentage that the organization pays. And when they have that in place, it allows them then and that's just my manager can just decide it's 60% this year, it's 75% next year when the budget comes back. Or, or what we do is you get one trip a year instead of two. I mean, right. there's, yeah. you, it's, well, it's a little bit of a belt taking thing. Yeah, but, I, but I think that goes to Jan's point earlier about setting the targets every year and then going to them. That's kind of what I was trying to say. Whether it's small or big, if we set those targets, we don't come back at the end and say, okay, what do we need to do if we're doing that proactively? It doesn't matter if it's big or small because we've already had those conversations yeah. about this is where we're going yeah. to going to go. It's, I mean, I think it's a it's a good exercise. And the other thing about efficiency is because you know the one thing we've made commitments to is replacing all of this and to the librarians specifically, which is, is a critical role. And I've really appreciated all of the advocacy they've done. Um, everybody's done on their behalf, and I have you know personal experience, obviously working at school, knowing how important they are. But when you think that we have some elementary schools that are almost 700 kids with one librarian, and some that are 240, that's wildly inefficient. Those are those are not the same job. Right. That that's there's no, and so I think this is where we talk about paired schools and and how that model works so that all of the kids have the resources. But when you look at that inefficiency, I don't think you can even say those two people and they make the same amount of money. And they touch every kid in the school. Well, that's three times the number of kids. That's you know the job's going to drop off uh, at some point. And so, again, I think for questions of equity from that perspective and, and opportunity savings, continuing that conversation in paired schools is just is going to. Maybe there's an efficiency important. piece that goes along with that because we use the weighted resource allocation model for certified staff and paraprofessionals. We don't use another employment category right now. And so we've had a, a pretty robust discussion over the past month about should this be applied to administrators, counselors, librarians, other support staff in the building. How does that look? What would it look like? So one of the things that we've talked about is as the dust settles, can we run a model and see what would that look like and how would it look different? So couple that with the pairing conversation. I think that there's some efficiency opportunities for us long term to talk about. And I think Sometimes when you talk about those when there isn't a crisis, there's a little bit more objectivity about it. There's a little less sense of panic, if you will, that we have to get this done in a short time frame. And, and I think it allows us to have a, a good dialogue both internally among the board and the administrators and externally among the school community so that they've got an opportunity to have some long-term input on it. And that, that helps us get to the point I think we're making really good decisions. And I'm gonna get to my one question that actually has to do with this. All right. Um, You've got 61 vacancies, and if you add all the other numbers up, you got like 36. It's 38 if you count the admin, right? I mean, yeah, I'm not up in there, that. but that's like 23 to 25 positions that are getting filled. And we talked about FCS, we talked about a couple of music but What's the rest of it going to? Is it to try and maintain the RAM numbers at schools? Sure. So or where a, are those spots? Because those question. are the pieces that if we're going to move anything around, you move around. But I don't know what they are. So as you look at this, one thing to look at here is you can look at some numbers. There's 31 elementary, right? Now, I, this would be better off if I had it as a grid instead of a list because you can't see all this. There's 31 <coughs> elementary. 10 junior high, 12 high school, 6th district. You drop down here to the residential, 13030. And then they're also broken down by reg ed, special ed, student services, and admin. So if you looked at it on a grid matrix, you'd find here's the number of elementary reg ed that are retirees and elementary reg ed that are resignees. You'd look at that, you'd add that up, and that's more than 21. That means that we've got some vacancies at the elementary level that we will have to fill. So one of the things that we're actually gonna be doing on Thursday um, is spending a marathon day going through and doing all that alignment to see where the gaps are 
Um, remember, we did the survey where we asked people where do you want to be next year? And we have some people that said, I'm intermediate, I want to be primary, I want to go the other way around, I'm at the elementary, I want to go to the junior high, vice versa, so we'll have a chance to take a look at that. Um, and then figure out how to align where the openings are uh, to uh, our needs so that we can get those uh, positions properly posted. Uh, in the past, we've been able to be a little bit more aggressive about it and a little less specific because we've had a little bit more space to work with. Um, this year, since we're going to be so targeted with it, we want to make sure that we are specifically looking at there's a fourth grade opening at this elementary school, there's an FCS opening at this high school, there's a band opening here, um, so that we're really specifically targeting it more so than we've been in the past. You know, I'll give you elementary teachers in the past. We, we've gone out and hired elementary teachers, um, and that placement process has often occurred after they've been hired. That will happen in the opposite process this year because we can't afford to overhire. So as we look to replace the vacancies that we have, we'll be very specific and targeted in that process. So is it fair to say that the net gain or loss or whatever at the elementary level is specifically trying to keep class sizes better? And at the secondary level, it's to not lose program, program or that class offerings. That would be a offerings. good summary of it, yes. Mm -hmm. And we're sort of no. trying we to want, look at We want to make ends. sure that we can uh, meet student registration demands at the secondary level. And at the elementary level, we want to make sure that we can meet or exceed the RAM number. And it's no, you know, the last minute we talked about as we look at priorities for future things we're going to do and prioritizing how we get things back. I think the I feel a little bit like you're, we're changing RAM to meet the need of our budget as opposed to meeting the needs of our kids, right? And I, I think that's in my head that's a that's a priority that we need to make sure we're still addressing is not getting the point where we get comfortable with really large class sizes because I think that's just a detriment uh, for you know across the board um, so I think that's a priority that we need to make sure we're getting back to so that's kind of where I was trying to figure out where yeah I know, the people uh, that are getting filled back in where you're they're the landing. one doing the math at the last work session where you're <laughs> yeah. trying to calculate moving some twos down to ones so <clears throat> after the work session I actually went back and was playing with that to see okay what would this look like um, so one of the things that we had talked to you about as a board is uh, how do we prioritize uh, uh, filling vacancies that have been left open? Uh, and so I would hope that it's this year, but I would look more forward to next year with it. But uh, as we get to the point, if there are resources available to look to replace positions here, we will come be, be coming back to you to ask uh, before we go out and start uh, uh, refilling. But I, I just want to give a caveat on that because that's a little unclear, I think, to the community. It sounds a little bit like um, the orchestra director is gone. We're not sure we're going to replace it. We'll talk to the board. So oh. I just want to be no, very no. clear that, no. that it's understood that, that yeah, go Yes, yeah, so exactly. So what I'm talking about is let's say, for instance, we got to the end of the road and there was an FTE that was unallocated inside the system. Before we made the decision, we'll put another elementary teacher in, or we'll fill another librarian, or we'll send somebody up to the secondary level, or we'll add a specialist at the elementary level. That's when we'll come back and ask. So if you think about a position like FCS, you think about that, uh, our band director at Northwest Junior High, our band director at, at City High, those are at positions that are already allocated inside the system from a program registration standpoint. We will be filling those positions. Yeah, and I understand that. And I, yeah. I just think based on some of the emails we're getting, that's, that's, not, that's not clear. I think what happened was people heard the message that if there is a vacancy, it is not going to be filled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, when we first started talking about this, we had a $6.5 million budget deficit, and we were looking at 75 people. That pretty much was the message we were giving our administrative team. Um, was don't plan on filling those jobs because we thought we were going to be in a position where we were riffing people. Um, we're not at that point now, um, which is a healthy opportunity for us. Uh, so, uh, and now we haven't hit the end of the road. Uh, we're not at April 30th yet. Uh, I see Chase sitting there with wheels turning his head. Um, and that, that's our riff deadline, but um, the plan is not to be in a position where we have to do that. Um, but I, I think you're right. I think 
I think we we sold that message pretty loud and pretty clear, and I think people heard it. And I think now that's why we've gotten some of those emails we have is that people heard that they've internalized it, and they are now I think justifiably concerned about that. But what I was thinking about was the situation that I mean, lawyers at orchestra, but the city high band situation is a, is a perfect example. And John and I have already been in contact about what his plan is and, and what he wants to do. And while Steve's right, those are already budgeting we want to allocate, we still do want to be conscious of where we are. So like all positions right now, we're posting everything internally for a week before we open it externally. You never know, right? Who might want to apply for that role that might have those qualities, and then what role does that open up behind there? And then dominoes could fall to a place where we look at how is it impacting something that we never imagined, and we can reallocate that. So we want to give ourselves that space to do that. But it wouldn't be that position that would be uh, that would ever be removed because of how we know it fits into the program needs. But we do want to give ourselves a little bit of flexibility. So we post internally first for a week, and it's in compliance with the negotiated agreement. <laughs> See, Grace said that. Before we would open it up externally, just to provide some. I, I have a few questions, if I may. Um, so since we the last couple of years in our student enrollment reports, we've not been doing the class numbers. And, and I know it's just really hard. Um, with registration being at the point it is for you guys to tell us what classes are we actually talking about at the secondary level. I pulled out our old documents from 2015 and 2016 to look at the actual classes that have the low class sizes. And um, I see a number of situations where you've got two sections and one of them has a low number and but if you put both of them together you're going to have a class of 40 or 50 kids or you know and, it, and it's not going to work. That's so a, so yeah. how are you going to deal with that? So we've got a couple of issues there uh, that are confounding. So one of the things that you see here um, when we're looking at our uh, secondary staffing is you're looking at all the single registration uh, numbers. So we said for any given class that's in the catalog, which, which class, which course has 20 or fewer registrations in it? I think one of the things that you see in that report that you're looking at is some scheduling inefficiencies that occur where you might have a section that has 16 in it, and then the next period there's a section with 34 in it. And you look at it and you think you could easily have two sections of 20 if you were able to, uh, or 25 if you were able to figure out how to do that right. But our scheduling inefficiency prevents that. So we didn't look at any classes that have at least 20 students enrolled in them. Um, now we did have that conversation with the secondary administrators that if if you're unable to get it scheduled efficiently, it doesn't mean that you get an extra right. section mm -hmm. yeah, that's in order to that teach that. Yeah. Uh, and so that may cause its own set of problems because sometimes that scheduling inefficiency is you have a kid who's taken three singletons and now you're trying to squeeze in the rest of his classes and he or she may not have a lot of flexibility in there. But that's going to be a challenge that they're going to have to take on through the uh, counseling office uh, at the secondary level to try to address that because we're not going to allocate additional FTE to compensate for, and I know this is the wrong term and the, the principal's yell at me, but that scheduling inefficiency, mm -hmm. that results from that. Okay, yeah, good. I, I'm good to hear that. The other thing I found in looking at the classes is that they don't line up with a person's credentials. So, you know, we've got music tech, we've got leadership, we've got video production, we've got acting, we've got, you know, um, an industrial tech class. We've got, you know, different things, and it's not like a one FTE that's going to be real easy to just sort of. No, you know. it's not. We had that conversation <laughs> today. Uh, I will tell you that I, um, I, well, sometimes this can be a uh, divisive process among the administrative team. They were very collaborative when I worked with them today, uh, and and they're looking at things. I'll give you an example. There's a a point two uh, world languages teacher uh, right now, uh, and uh, immediately there was a conversation about she teaches here, but if she taught there, then that would allow an efficiency in staffing here, which would allow us all to offer what we need if we're able to make that transition. So we have given them the task of looking at this jigsaw puzzle collectively, so the reduction at the secondary level is designed to be done with all six comprehensive schools, not individually here or individually there or individually there for exactly that reason. Because if you have a point eight teacher on staff and suddenly now you have a 1.0 need, then the question is, does somebody else have a point eight staff? 
and therefore do we need to flip staff so that their FTE matches the courses that we need to be filled and that brings its own set of challenges working through the association but the sooner we get that done then the more efficient we can be with it um, and and then they also brought this up and we're going to have to work through it is are you going to have some 0.17s, 0.2s that are hanging out there at the end because of these classes and then we're going to have to take a look at that and see how that lines. And that's what I'm wondering because, and, and my, my point really was that the subject matters don't it, line up. So right. the, the certification to teach the class, I, I'm, I'm afraid that you're, you're going to end up with some partial FTEs and, and I don't know how that works um, with uh, your that's why I said agreements and things. That's why I said Chase's wheels are still spinning because it potentially <laughs> there's a potential you could have some partial FTE layoffs. Mm -hmm. There's a potential that could happen. And that's I think where our partnership with the ICEA comes into play as well. Ray and had a number of conversations and you know he's been very collaborative and willing to meet and sit down with me. And so we're gonna try to work through some of those mm -hmm. situations. We just until tomorrow, until this week, yeah. we, we just continue to funnel it down. And so now, boy, those are the questions that are kind of staring us right in the face. But I will say, like I said, that uh, our, our secondary administrative team today was, was really collaborative uh, and really focused on problem solving, um, which I, I, that puts us in a good place um, because there's a recognition that if everybody gives a little bit, we can get to where we need to be in the end. Um, it's not going to be. You're losing two FTE at West, two FTE at City, two FTE at Liberty. They've already talked about that. You know, Greg was looking at where he's at with student uh, loss. Um, he's looking at where he's at with retirements and resignations. What could he avoid filling that would create some extra space? He might have to take on a disproportionate share of the burden this year, but then that preserves the ability for John to keep somebody who he might otherwise have to reduce part time. So they were already having those conversations. I, this is just a comment that um, you know there's not a lot of electives at the junior high level. There's and not a lot of what? There's not a lot of electives. No. And the electives that we do have, some of them have small numbers, so they're probably going to be yeah. easy targets to cut. And and just I'm just commenting that it's sort of sad to see us get rid of electives at the junior high level and replace it with a study hall. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one know, of the things. Not, one of the things that uh, you're more likely to see at the junior high is, is some classes that run with smaller numbers. Um, and part of it is that smaller number of electives. We've actually asked them for a smaller reduction because they okay. have less flexibility. But back to Phil's uh, observation earlier, you know, one of the things that this has allowed us to do, you know, don't squander a good crisis, is to really ask, so what do we offer in that elective rotation at the junior high? And is it most beneficial for the kids as they get ready to consider career pathways moving up through the high school. Um, and so our, to their credit, our junior high administrators have said, you know, when the dust settles here, we want to we stop, step back, peel away the, the, the assumptions that we have about offering those electives and consider what else we might do. Yeah, because they do sort of fall in, you know, the fine art sort of, you know, realm. And not so much in if you want to build interest or, in a program, you know, you know we know that, uh, you know, we talked about A, well, we know that what built the interest in Project Lead the Way was offering a gateway program at the middle school level because kids started saying, hey, what else you got? So what else could we do that would offer students additional opportunities? Junior high school still a lot of exploration. Right. And, and the comment that one of our administrators made was we do explore in a very tiny box. So how do we expand that so the kids have a greater area to explore and then hopefully make better choices about career pathways that might be of interest to them and try them out earlier. And I'm glad to hear that because I, you know, as a parent of a high school student who's gone all the way through, it becomes very um, scripted. If you want to go to a four, you know, to a college, yep. you've got to do these classes this year, these classes this year, and it feels like there's not a lot of room. Um, and like it almost feels like you know when you start, you got to know where you're going. Yeah. And they don't know where they're oh, going. No. They don't know where they're, they're going when they're done with it sometimes. Yeah. Um, so I, I do think, I, I like your approach that if you can try to preserve junior high options, give our kids yeah. the opportunity and then to really revision you know, see some of those things yeah. and have it not just all be the required courses and that's your only choices. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> So if I could just, in, uh, if you'd indulge me in just one more uh, collective round of thanks. This didn't happen 
uh, by happenstance. There was a lot of hard work uh, by <laughs> members of the central office administrative team, by members of the building administrative team, collaborative dialogue with the ICEA. Uh, I work with, uh, with folks out in the field. Um, this is never an easy process. Um, when you want to add a program, there's 15 people that will knock at your door and spend the money six times over. Um, when you step up and say, hey, we have to cut the budget, um, you can often find yourself alone in the room with nobody who wants to help out because it's not much fun. Uh, but uh, I, I've got to give the team collectively uh, credit for stepping up when they were asked to do so, make hard decisions, make uh, volunteer things that, that could be uh, uh, trimmed or reduced or otherwise changed in their program. Um, so not an easy process, but a, a, a solid team effort. And so I'm uh, just really appreciative of everybody who participated in the process. This is what we will be discussing April 9th. We will. We'll bring this back to you. Um, I, I won't bring you any more retirements since that window's closed. Um, we may have additional resignations between now and then. I'll make sure to get that updated okay. for you. Uh, we will bring in the sheet out. I'll take out the grade ones on the bottom. I just wanted to have those in there so we had the opportunity to cover that and discuss that today. Um, I may uh, add the sheet from the very beginning just so that uh, it that gives us good. some perspective of that, that first um, reduction um, and it gives us kind of a start to finish on that. Um, and, uh, and then, Lori, we can have that conversation up front and see if there's any community comment that comes out of that and then we'll have the <coughs> opportunity to affirm that at the next meeting. Yeah. I just tell me when it's appropriate to ask my question about transportation. Oh, I don't want to close time. the meeting out before. Yeah. Okay, so I need to bring you back to. Sorry, I forgot about that. that was that's my all right. Error. My notes are over there. I need a little bit more direction. Um, I want to bring you back to February 12th, where Joan and different people reported on the attendant support oh, yeah. busing conversation. Okay, so yeah. as we've now tried to put that all on paper and roll it out, we haven't quite rolled it out. Um, that night, what um, what you heard from us was it was a, the committee had a hard time thinking about where they would try to draw any lines or conclusions about we had more requests than we know we have the ability to provide routes for. So currently we're using 14 attendant support busing routes that are out there. Initially, when you talk about that first budget sheet, remember we came to you and said, what about cutting two routes? We'd take it down to 12. Well, that was a hard stop for you guys. We heard you we heard you there. But what we're faced with right now is the um, dilemma as we, again, we're trying to put everything on paper to roll out to our um, building admins, is that night there was a small paragraph towards the end of one of those presentation items that said, you know, the committee had a hard time saying where they would draw any sort of line at. You know, they wanted to provide all the students they could that busing. So the administrative consideration, I think, is how we termed it, said, Understanding the constraints that we're under, and although not discussed with the committee, a decision may need to be made about what areas receive priority. If this were the case, taking those um, schools or areas ranked with a score of 13 or higher, as well as reducing southeast to one route, would be the recommendation. And then in addition to this, we would work hard to provide solution for areas ranked with a score of 11 and 12. Well, um, the, but the discussion that's ensued since then is um, Southeast is really feeling like they need that second route. And so the question on the table is, do we go back and add that Southeast second route? They have one. Um, and if so, then that would mean, does that mean we're reducing an elementary route? Or would you be directing us to add a 15th route? And if that's the case, then we've got to do a little bit more work there. I didn't quite follow all that, out. Amy. I'm so sorry. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I need like a chart to like yeah, see, see all. these options. Well, I, I apologize. Yeah. So, do you want to trade Steve, buses or right. add a bus and lose some? February 12th, That's the bottom line. February 12th, I'm going to show them. And they cut something somewhere else. Or and cut a route from one of the elementary yeah. schools. Or give Southeast, leave everything the same, add a route, do more work on this budget sheet, meaning we have to. Fund more by cutting something. What's a route cost? Yeah, sixteen. And maybe, uh, Steve, as you've looked at that, have Here's you um, taken into account yet the uh, pay to ride? Yeah. And that's all been factored yeah. in. So those were, that are that ranked out as eleven or twelve, we put them down to pay to ride. I did okay. have a question from one of the elementary principals today, though, that said, if there's not a bus going by. 
that particular street, are we still going to route it? Typically, our language reads that we don't route a bus there. It's on, you know, only if it's an existing stop. I didn't have an answer for that either. Um, so this is okay. I'm going to just go real fast to the little quote that I just read. Do the southeast <clears throat> the southeast students have better access to public transportation uh, was, as an option? That was part of the, um, the discussion that day, and it sounds like um, there's not a great deal of uh, public transportation. It's difficult, there. yeah, at best. It, it, it's available, but, but it's difficult. Yeah, and yeah, for okay. you know, a junior high issue. student to. Yeah. Then we catch the bus, and yeah. any of us that had junior high students know <laughs> that can be a challenge. Yeah. So, so both of those buses go south of Highway 6 then? Gosh, now you're asking me technically. The southeast, it says yeah. south That'd of Highway 6. That'd be like us with 127 yeah. students probably. That's 127 kids. And which <laughs> elementary is on the edge? So we said we take any building ranked 12 or higher for attendant support with the reduction of one of these routes to southeast, that would get us to our 14, okay? So then the 11s and 12s became pay to rides. Mm -hmm. And I did have a question, like I said today, from one of those elementary principals that said, does that mean you're gonna guarantee it if we get the pay, pay to ride applications in on time? So, well, I'm gonna need to clarify that. I believe the answer is yes. Yeah, I believe the answer to that is yes. Yeah, well, yeah I, I think right that's applicant. the easy, it, rather than you know cutting the busing, I mean, yeah. just route it one street over or whatever. And I understand, you know, that all shakes out somewhere, but... I mean, what would it be, so for the Longfellow and those Lincoln, I mean, that's a pretty small number of kids. Is there any way to problem solve that without an entire bus route? Yeah, that's what Jones come to me recently and said, is potentially could we use some of our vans. And so, until we can start to actually rock the kids and see who's going to apply, and um, that's, it's, some of this is like a little bit of a crapshoot. Well, and though both of those are going to be super transitional. Mm -hmm. and, you know, Primanac kids are going to be there all year. And yeah. so that might make more sense to be able to be flexible with a van yeah. rather than have a bus go when sometimes there might not be kids there. Yeah. Um, but I would want to make sure we are doing that. And that was, you know, I think Craig made that point, like we, we problem solve this way all of the time with you know individual cases. I mean, cutting one of those southeast buses, you know, you're talking about 60 kids, and that's not, I mean, I live south of Highway 6, that is not a safe walk. Crossing Highway 6 yeah. is not safe. And and we're probably, at, you know, I mean, we know why we need to attend the support bus and because the kids aren't getting to school. So, I mean, when I look at the numbers, to me, that kind of says we could probably be more flexible with the number of kids that are going to be, you know, from, come from those areas in Lincoln and Longfellow. But those kids at South, I mean, the kids South of Highway 6 are going to be living there all year, and, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it, the kids in that South of Highway 6, Southeast, are those all kids that are zoned to Southeast, or are it some of them that are choosing to go to Southeast versus Northwest? Mm -hmm. That I don't know. You, might, just curious have, on you that. might have a mix. And, and then there would be a bus that goes to Northwest from that area already, correct? There may be, yeah. Bus 25. So what he's asking is, do you have some kids that are uh, uh, zoned northwest but going southeast? The answer is probably yes. I, I, I don't know that for a fact, but I, based on previous years, I'm guessing the answer is yes. So if I remember right, the budget impact for um, to the general fund is like 30 grand or so. It is split between Pepple, right? Pepple and, Pepple and right. Yeah. So, speaking for myself only, I would support finding a cut somewhere else. Um, we already yeah. have a surplus. 11,000. <laughs> I mean, sorry. So we need Spend my surplus on another 20. <laughs> I, I feel like, you know, it's, I mean, it's a, we're starting at the very yep. basic, gotta get there. 
before you can learn. Yeah. So yeah. I'm kind of in that space too, actually. Okay. And I, I know another 20,000 or whatever the number is defined is not easy, but. Mm -hmm. We just need, again, you know, what we said when we sat down and talked about this was we just need to know where you're at, um, and then it's our job to make that work. I mean, it feels like the southeast route, we're pretty much saying because of Highway 6 is in the, in the number of students. Mm -hmm. Well, keep in mind, we wouldn't be here if we had an easy answer for right. the problem. I get it. When we sat down, we couldn't come up with an easy answer. We didn't look at one of these routes and say, oh, get rid of that one and put this right. one in. And it's not hard for so. me just to come around to that. All right. Thank you guys. All right. Thanks. Pebble? Pebble. Oh gosh. Pearl. 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 I meant Pearl. Got all done with this. I forgot there was another item. Pearl. Pearl. Jim Stone. Who's not going to get the right It starts with a P. That's about how oh, we right now. I thought we were done too. Pearl something. Pearl. Um, so the Pearl discussion, remember our last conversation about that was uh, I, the conversation about moving forward with November as an option. Um, we kind of left that uh, for further discussion. Um, so I, as Craig and I were sitting down and talking about this, our question for you is, what do you need from us? Um, we, we, uh, we would again uh, recommend that um, from an alignment with least cost, greatest visibility, um, perhaps uh, best opportunity to leverage voters that uh, we think the November uh, election is a good fit. Um, and, and if you do, then the, our next process collectively is to reach out uh, to some of our interested community members, see if we've got some folks that are interested in, in helping okay. us advocate. Yeah. And I'm all for it. We do have a role, though, in identifying how we want the money spent. Yes. So it's not, it's not, we can't just put it completely nope. out. No, we're, we're not, uh, not done by a long shot. We just, uh, it, uh, from our standpoint, uh, as Craig and I were talking about it, it's, uh, we, if we know that it's a go, then we have next steps that we can start to bring forward to you While to, for we instance, figure out define a purpose. How to spend it. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I say go. Okay. And the only reason we're pushing you on this, to be perfectly honest with you, is there's nine weeks till the end of the school year. Yep. Not a lot happens over the summer. We don't want to find ourselves in September at square one. So yeah, if, if it's go. a go, yeah. then yeah. We'll, we will. I'm going to be the contrarian. I think it's impractical to do it this November. I, I think it's too fast. I don't think it's enough time to prepare. Uh, and I'm, I don't have a firm grasp of what all it would do. And I, I don't feel like this November is a practical time frame, but you know, the majority does, they do, and you know, I, I will do what I can to support it, but I don't feel like it's an appropriate timeline. I think it's worth giving it a shot. Um, starting, so, Steve, when we start the legwork now, whatever <coughs> kind of steps we have to take, we have to figure out how we would spend the money. Yep. I mean, at some point, we could say, I mean, if we spend a little bit more time working on it, we could say, you're right, Sean, it's not feasible. But, yep. but then it's a special election if we don't hit November, which is more expensive, or we wait two years to get into the November election, which feels like we're missing an opportunity to have some of that money in our, in our, in our hands to spend, right? And, and do stuff Potentially. I, I look at it as, you know, what's the likelihood of getting something like that to pass? And you're talking about the first time you're going to throw a school election on with the city election and everything else. That is going to be confusing enough. And I think it will muddy the waters to throw on another ask for money at the same time. I, I may be completely off base on it, but it seems like a lot to ask in a short time frame. I mean, same. So. I think I'm the opposite of you, which is why I asked for this. <laughs> I think the first time I felt like maybe you guys were all on that page and I was a lone wolf. But um, I think that it's the right time to do it. You're already having discussions about budget and money this year. It's front of mind for a lot of people. You're going to go into an election where you're again you're you're going to have board candidates out there discussing this in their forums or whatever. I mean, it's it's going to be. Um, Something that I'd rather have now than in a special election, personally. It's not a, it's not a bond requirement to pass. It's no, 50%, 50%, right? So. That's right. Yeah. 
with our taxes, uh, our local property taxes and that with the retirement fund and, and making our management fund to cover up uh, or to cover the expenses that we have. I just think it's, you know, we got to be, we got to be careful the amount of debt we're putting on our community and, and that and, uh, uh, and doing that. That's, that's so if not question. now, when is, I guess, was my follow up to that. One question I had asked, Steve, and you probably remember is what exactly would it cost for a special election? So when we're talking eight hundred thousand dollars versus you know, and it's you know fifteen grand for the special election. Yeah, we've got a couple you know, different maybe. quotes from him, and, and uh, yeah. to be honest with you, and I aren't sure. Um, it's a fair we initially point. Initially, we're told it could cost upward to forty-five thousand um, dollars. The most recent right. quote was in the fifteen to twenty range. So uh, we think that's probably more likely. I think part of the problem is not having administered one of these joint elections there, it's still unsure of the total cost. So I think we're getting a range. So we may find out after November 13th that it's a lot cheaper, or we may find out that it's a lot more expensive. We just don't know. And, and I just worry we're doing a special election, the turnout's going to be so low. And you know, people are going to understand what it means. I mean, if you do it in a campaign cycle with uh, people running for office, they can campaign on it. They can at your point, they can talk about it in forums and stuff and educate people about what it means, what are the benefits, and the, the message really gets out there. I do worry about a special election, like a thousand people showing up. You know what I mean? I, I, I totally agree with that. And it, I, I would buy into it more if it was a normal school election in that regard. Yeah. Because I think you're going to have a lot of people out there who pay attention to city council or supervisor or whatever yeah. else there is and be like, oh, there's school stuff on here too. And they may not be, they're not paying attention to school forms where people are campaigning on it or whatnot. And I think it will sort of just be, oh, and they're asking for money again. And it, it won't be an informed decision. Yeah. Now, that being said, the majority has already said they're, they're for it. And I'm going to support it because I, I think it, you know, we can't turn down money if people want to give us money. I just think it's going to be a, a, a big ask to try and... Yeah. Uh, you know, get behind I, it that fast. I, got I think it's going to be hard. T tonight, by someone who's worried about class sizes. And I, I think most people don't understand school finance, and they're like, just raise taxes. Yeah. Just, they're asking just raise taxes. Well, in our general, like, we can't. We could raise taxes. We could spend money. Right. Yeah. Right? So they don't understand this idea of spending authority. So I think, because I think that's people's mindset. Like, I'm in this community. I'm willing to pay the money for this quality of education. I, I have a feeling in a general election this is going to sail through. Um, because even people who aren't paying attention because the voters in this, you know, Johnson County probably has seen too many taxes it doesn't like. And so, it, I mean, that, and, and not that I support that, and not that I think we just need to tax people to high heaven. I, I'm, I think we're really responsible with it. I think that we've been uh, responsible in the way, you know, for example, right, the way Craig has shifted uh, we picked up the management fund by bringing down our cash reserves. I think that's just a very wise thing to do. It's probably nobody's favorite thing to do to, to lose that cash reserve because it's it's a nice rainy day fund, but in a crisis. So politically, I think we'll be fine just because it's a low threshold. Um, I do get the concern with just going out and asking, you know, with your hand up all the time. I, do, I, I don't want to feel like we're a board that is easy to do that. I, I do think there are so many things we could pay for with this, including child, early child education. 
Um, playgrounds. Playgrounds. You know, we got emails recently about, um, you know, to the point on Special Olympics, like what kind of other types of facilities other than a ramp on your yeah. playground you had, you know, there are other ways that we could pay for facilities for kids with disabilities to engage in more, you know, robust activities, right? There are things out there that are just dollar item. Yeah. Item. And yeah, I like I said, you don't have to need to sell me on the yeah, fund itself, right? right? I, it's the <coughs> I, 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 I don't see a negative to that. I, yeah. I think it is the, the handout, like, you know, mm -hmm. give me more the optic of it so soon after the bond. And then even if it does sail through, I worry a little bit, does it then affect you the next time you need to go out and do it? There's like, oh man, they just asked two elections in a row. Now it's a third. Like, so, and yeah, it is a yeah. much smaller number, right, yeah, <laughs> compared to anything cents. else. And yeah. so that's probably the saving grace of it. But it, it, is it, it 13, concerns 13 cents a thousand or 13 cents a uh, hundred thousand? 13 cents a hundred thousand. And yeah, I can understand the concern um, and the fact that this may, I mean, we may get to the point, get close to November, and not be able to follow through for whatever reason. But I, I, I was, I think, on that side last time when we discussed this, that, you know, it's too soon, let's not do it. But seeing the fact of all the things we can pay for, I, I, I think as a district, we need to at least try. Well, and if we do some of that legwork now, it's going to be in place for you know, if we if we decide to until we have to rescind it, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And so that, that's, that's you know, you are standing on the shoulders of the board who's looked at it before. Um, right. So you know, when, when you said, "Hey, we're interested in this," they're going to say, "Great, we got stuff for you." Yeah. Um, because a previous group sat around and had the same conversation. At that point in time, they decided it's not the right time. But we did a lot of the legwork for it at the time, which made bringing it forward to do this time that much easier because we had done that much more prep work for it. And you know, the one thing I would be interested to see is um, if we decide to start exploring this, you know, what is that community reaction going to exactly. be? It's like, we yeah. want to support, we want to get sure. forward, we that's want to run this campaign. And that might give us an idea of the more of a Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking of getting. Because if we can't find somebody to run it. If there are stakeholders right. out there for the bellwethers that we could kind of get there to take, you know, the appetite. Mm -hmm. Early on, I don't know. So I guess my thought would be, if you guys can yep. do it, develop the uh, budget. We'll get some timelines, some budgets, you know, and things like how that. How the money would be yep. spent. Put that together for you, give you some options. We'll kind of through, uh, remember this is what you can spend the dollars on, here's all the work. We'll put that information together for you. Cool. And then uh, when we have that ready to roll, we'll get that whole session. OK. Anything else to do with the cause? Otherwise, the motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.